Okay, so welcome everyone to the very first 2022 uh, seminar um, within our Paleo Pet series. Um, it's really nice to see so many of you um, back here um, for our first seminar. Um, I'd like to welcome Tyler Kukla um, from Colorado State University in the United States of America. And Tyler will be presenting a talk entitled Terrestrial Ecosystem Resilience in the Geologic Past. So if you haven't been to a paleo park seminar before, um, we uh, have a quick rundown. So we'll do um, welcome and announcements for the first couple of minutes, um, followed by Tyler's talk um, with a moderated Q&A um, and um, an informal chat um, that we call tea time um, after the talk for about half an hour. Um, don't forget to send your questions via the chat to the questions at Paleo Perks host, who today is Chrissy. So a bit of housekeeping. Um, so Paleo Perks values the participation of everybody interested in the paleo sciences. Please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. If you somehow found yourself here without signing our code of conduct, please remember to go to our website and have a quick um, look at this and, and sign it. Please remember to mute yourself for the duration of the talk. Um, if you find that you shouldn't be able to do this, but if you find that you can, um, please remember not to, um, so that we can maintain a quiet environment for our speaker. Um, you can ask questions by chatting directly to the questions at PaleoPerks host, or um, you're very welcome to use the raise hand function as well and ask by voice. All technical issues should also go to the questions host too. We now have closed captions built into our Zoom and you can use the CC button to show or hide them at the bottom of your screen. If you do this, um, it won't change for the rest of the meeting. Um, we'll be dropping a couple of links into the chat very shortly. Um, so remember to nominate all of your um, amazing early career friends um, for our series. Um, it's really great to see um, who is nominated via our form. Um, we also have a weekly feedback form for demographic information. Um, this just tells us a little bit about who's attending. Um, it's anonymous, it's optional, but very much encouraged. And you'll be able to find both of these links in the chat window very shortly. So um, I'd now like to welcome um, our speaker, Tyler Kukla, um, who we're very excited to host. Um, so Tyler did um, his bachelor's um, in Earth and Planetary Sciences at Northwestern University in the US, followed by his PhD um, at Stanford. And he's now currently a postdoc um, at Colorado State. Um, so Tyler, um, I'm now going to hand over to you. Uh, thank you. Can you see my screen? I can. Great. Um, I can't actually. So just a second here. Oh, hang on. Okay. It's not. Oh no, it's come up. All right. I can see it now. All right. Um, thank you very much for the for the kind introduction, and uh, and thank you all for being here today. And also happy 2022. Um, as mentioned, I'm Tyler Cook about a topic that is fitting for the times, which is resilience. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about the resilience of terrestrial ecosystems or ecosystems on land and their resilience to climate throughout geologic time or in the geologic past. Um, before we dive into that, though, I want to just get started with this image in the background here. This is an image of the Western, uh, the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And if you're not familiar with the geography of this image, that's OK. Um, because what I want to point out here is just this beautiful mosaic that exists between the dark green forests and the more golden kind of interwoven open habitats and, and grassy ecosystems. These grassy ecosystems that exist on this landscape are the product of forest dieback, a massive forest dieback event that occurred somewhere around 20 to 25 million years ago. And as best as we know, the forests never regained continental scale dominance of the, of the landscape after they died off. This is one of the common problems that makes forest dieback so consequential. Uh, people that study modern ecosystem resilience will tell you that losing your forest uh, can run the risk of making it very difficult to get it back, even after all of the climatic conditions return back to where they were when the forest once covered the landscape. Uh, this is in large part because new grassy habitats can become uh, stabilized and, and comfortable on the landscape after they expand. This makes the loss of forests like those in the Western US and in the Amazon rainforest, which both of which we'll talk about today, uh, some of the, the more pressing issues as we're thinking about all of the different forcings that we're imposing on the earth system right now. And one of the key challenges that we face in unraveling and understanding these issues is trying to discern what poses a more urgent threat 
to forest dieback? Is it global climate change or is it local changes that are happening with deforestation, uh, environmental pollution and biodegradation? Discerning between these two is important for things like writing policy, uh, but they're difficult to discern between when it comes down to observations because the fingerprint of human activity exists on just about every single landscape on the planet today. So separating that out from the climatic effects or climatic change uh, is, is a really challenging thing to do when you wanna separate these local and global influences. And the geologic past provides us with an opportunity to study the natural relationship between climate and vegetation and hopefully better contextualize and inform what part of all the changes that we're observing uh, around the planet today is related to direct human influence um, at the local level as opposed to the anthropogenic forcing of global climate. So uh, this is obviously thinking about like long-term changes, you know, in the very, very long term when we're thinking about hundreds to thousands of years. Uh, if we lose our forested ecosystem from all of the changes that we're imposing on the earth system, is that going to be something that is rather permanent or not? This is a, a question that we can talk about through the lens of resilience. And when I talk about resilience, uh, for those of you who are familiar with re resilience in science, uh, I'm going to talk about ecological resilience as opposed to engineering resilience today. And ecological resilience can be understood with kind of this Mad Libs that I'm putting up on the board here. Uh, we talk, I'll talk about it as the resilience of blank to blank. And the first blank is the state of the system. The resilience of something that defines the system that we're interested in to the second blank, which is some forcing that's been imposed upon that system. So today we'll talk about the resilience of tree cover, which is how I'm defining the state of this terrestrial landscape to drying or decreases in, in precipitation. The key question here is how much can we dry out our landscape before we start to lose our tree cover or experience pretty substantial uh, forest dieback. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna explore this with two different case studies. Uh, and these are kind of two flip sides of a similar coin. The first part is looking at the Western US. And uh, in this case, in the last 20 million years, there's this really clear evidence for vegetation change, giving us the landscape that I showed you in that image right at the beginning. But we don't have any clear evidence for climate change that's associated with this vegetation transition. And this has led some to hypothesize that the forests that cover the Western US are not that resilient to climate, because if they were, it would take a pretty substantial climatic signal in order to cause their dieback, and we just don't have one. So we'll dive into that a little bit. Uh, and then in part two, we'll look at kind of the opposite issue here, where in the Amazon rainforest, which as far as we know has persisted across the, the tropical South America for millions of years, uh, we have direct evidence for changes in rainfall, but the, this evidence is qualitative, and it's not clear if the changes in rainfall that have occurred uh, are enough to actually stress the ecosystem out, or if they have been large and the ecosystem has gone under stress, but it's been resilient to those changes in rainfall. So we're going to start off with part one here. The first thing that you need to know about the Western United States or, or Western U.S. vegetation is that it has basically existed in the, in the simplest of forms in two different states in the last 50 million years. There was this forested state where, as far as we know, there were no like regionally dominant grassy open habitat ecosystems, uh, or at least they were very rare. And this spans the Eocene through the Oligocene about 50 to 25 million years ago, at which point we undergo a transition that I'm going to call the open habitat transition to this grassy open habitat that spans the Miocene up until today. We still have forested ecosystems in the Western US, but they're largely restricted to the highlands where we still have rainfall induced by, by topography and mountains. One way that we know about this uh, is from phytoliths. So we also have a bunch of fossil data. Uh, these phytoliths are, are, phytoliths are little pieces of biogenic silica that grasses produce, and their shape can tell us about what kind of environment different grass put together and, and many of these points measured by my colleague, Carolyn Stromberg, uh, that shows a substantial increase in the percentage of phytoliths that indicate an open habitat environment associated with what I'm calling the open habitat transition. When I say open habitat, what I'm referring to is just a landscape that if you were sitting in that landscape and you looked up, you would be able to see sky. It's not a closed canopy like you would find in, in many forests. This transition would have had a pretty major impact on the vegetation and the characteristics of the landscape uh, all across the Western US. So um, here is a, a just kind of a compare side by side comparison on the left is a mural by Larry Felder that is based on the fossil data of central Oregon 
uh, illustrating what it might have looked like 40 million years ago, back when the landscape was much more lush than it is today. And on the right uh, is Central Oregon in at zero million years ago in 2018. This is a drone image complete with all of the forest fires uh, smoke of that summer. And it's a stark difference from what once existed. And we still, again, don't really understand what drove this transition. The key hypothesis for why grassy open habitats began to take over the Western US um, used to be that it has to do with global temperature. Uh, there's changes in global temperature associated with this, but a recent update to the global temperature curve from Westerholt et al. in 2020 uh, erased a lot of that variability. There's not really any systematic changes in global temperature that are now consistent with the timing of this open habitat transition in the Western US. So with that kind of set aside, the leading hypothesis right now is that the expansion of these open grassy habitats has to do with the shift to drier summers. This is a kind of difficult hypothesis to test, uh, but one of the, the challenges or one of the, the lines of evidence, really the main one, is that the type of vegetation that showed up resembles the kind of vegetation that exists today in places that have a warm dry season, indicating that the onset of a warm dry season might have driven the onset of these open habitats. Uh, the, the challenge is that, that that evidence comes from the vegetation transition itself, and we don't really have independent evidence for uh, climatic changes associated with this transition. And testing the drier summer hypothesis um, can be a little bit challenging because drier summers mean something different depending on where, excuse me, where you are in the landscape. So um, there we go. Uh, the Western US marks a pretty sharp gradient in precipitation seasonality from winter wet in the West to summer wet in the East. All of these black squares are places where we've identified uh, or others have identified the open habitat transition. And uh, it spans this winter wet to summer wet climate as we go from West to East. And so drier summers is gonna mean something different everywhere. It also might be difficult to identify in different places because of this. But another thing that I wanna point out is that a key factor that determines the seasonality of precipitation in the Western US is topography or tectonics. This is the Cascades mountain range ridgeline. Uh, it marks a, a pretty sharp drop off from a very winter wet climate in the west to a somewhat less winter wet climate as we move to the east. And the continental drop off between a winter wet climate and a summer wet climate. So we can imagine that changes in these topographic boundary conditions can affect and influence the spatial distribution of precipitation seasonality in the past um, and impact how uh, drier summers or drier winters might have evolved through time. The first thing that we need to do, uh, we're gonna attempt to test this summer aridity hypothesis today. The first thing we need to do to do so is find a, a signal of seasonal climate change. And this is, is not straightforward. There are really only a few main reasons that or main ways that we, we know how to do this. And perhaps the most common is to use uh, fossils, to use animals, to use things that lived on seasonal timescales. If we sampled, this Eocene, Eocene bivalve at a very high resolution, uh, we would be able to resolve geochemical signatures of monthly to seasonal timescales um, that were are associated with the formation of this shell. The challenge is that this shell formed over the course of about a few years probably. Uh, and if we wanna build a record that spans millions and millions of years, we need a heck of a lot of data in order to pull out a statistically significant signal from these animals that are living on very, very short timescales, relatively speaking. So another thing that we can do is that we can look at fossil soils, which I skipped right over. There we go. We, should, we can look at fossil soils. And uh, those of us that live anywhere near soils today, which I'm guessing is most of us, um, we'll know that soils don't form seasonally. This is not a record of, of seasonality that's going to capture like the actual formation of, of the, the tool that we're using, but some of the minerals within fossil soils do form on seasonal timescales and other ones don't. And what this means is that if we compare geochemical signatures of these different minerals, uh, the, any change in seasonal climate is gonna be reflected differently in one mineral versus the one that doesn't form seasonally. And we can use that to infer these seasonal trends in the past. That's the approach that we're going to take here. Mm -hmm. So we compiled uh, about 2000 or so data, existing data points contributed 176 new data points of soil carbonates and orthogenic clays. Uh, these are two different minerals that you can find in, in soils or fossilized soils or paleosols. And you can compare their oxygen isotope ratios to learn something about seasonality because soil carbonates are known for forming 
on seasonal time scales, primarily in the drier, warmer time of the year. Clays, on, on the other hand, form much more slowly and integrate much longer time scales of formation and of uh, oxygen isotopes. We're using oxygen isotopes here because they track the oxygen isotopic composition of precipitation. They're basically a geochemical tracer for what rainfall is doing on the landscape. And if we're using these seasonal uh, proxy minerals, then we're able to reconstruct seasonal precipitation patterns or information about seasonal precipitation in the past. Another reason that this works is that even though we know that the western region of this domain is, is winter wet and the eastern is more summer wet, the seasonality of delta O18, the isotopic composition of precipitation, is basically the same. It's higher in the summer and it's lower in the winter, whether we're in the western part, the central part, or the domain. So this means that regardless of the seasonality of precipitation itself, we can use the same interpretive framework to reconstruct uh, oxygen isotopes and the, and the seasonality that we're going to reconstruct um, because the seasonal pattern of Delta 18 is the same across this entire landscape. This has also likely been the case for at least the past 50 million years. This seasonal cycle is set by really basic fundamental atmospheric circulation patterns that emerge in very extreme modeling scenarios. You can run a model that only has uh, an ocean and no land whatsoever, and you'll still get a seasonal delta 18 pattern at these latitudes that looks like the one that I'm showing here. So uh, I'll walk you through the carbonate data and then the clay data, and then we're going to compare them to each other to try and reconstruct uh, the seasonality of precipitation more directly. This is the phytolith record on the bottom with age on the x-axis from 50 million years ago to today. In the carbonate data, um, the key feature of these data is that not much changes. There we go. Uh, not much changes. There, there isn't a huge change in Delta 18 in any of these domains, except for maybe a slight decrease in the Eastern domain uh, through time. And we see in this box and whisker plot on the right that before and after the open habitat transition, which is marked by this green bar, um, the distributions of Delta 18 are very similar. The clay data, on the other hand, uh, show a different trend. There is a pretty substantial increase, a statistically significant one, in each of these domains as we cross the open habitat transition. This is kind of perplexing uh, because we generally interpret clays and carbonates as giving us the same kind of information. In this case, that's clearly not true. We have two very distinct trends through time, uh, depending on the mineral that we're looking at. And other studies have looked at this before um, and interpreted the difference between clay and carbonate O18. Uh, this is the first one to identify a difference in the trend through time. And fortunately, the work that has been done in the past allows us to build an interpretive framework for understanding transitions like this. And I'll walk through that interpretive framework now by directly comparing the clay and the carbonate oxygen isotope data. So uh, I'm going to use this, this term called big delta. Big delta is just the difference between the little delta O18 of clay minus the little delta O18 of carbonate. That gives us this big delta O18 of clay minus carbonate. And the key, the key thing to notice here is that what I'm doing is I'm subtracting out this equilibrium value. Basically, if clays and carbonates are recording the same exact information, we know what the big delta value should be. If they're recording different information, then we can look for deviations from that expected big delta value. So the big delta value for the same information between clay and carbonate minerals, uh, because I've subtracted out this equilibrium value, is zero. So we care about the deviations from zero. In order to understand how to interpret these deviations from zero, we need to know two pieces of information. The first is how the relative bias in clay and carbonate formation. This has been really well studied. Uh, carbonates tend to form under drier conditions, and clays tend to form under wetter conditions. So the comparison of them is a, a proxy. the same framework that has been used in these studies on the bottom right that has have also previously interpreted clay carbonate delta 18 differences. The other thing we need to know is the seasonality of delta 18, which I talked about earlier. Winter is the low delta 18 season in the Western US today. Summer is the high delta 18 season. And we expect that this has been the case for, again, at least the last 50 million years and probably much longer. This is a good assumption that this holds throughout our record. What this means is that we can now imagine if we have a winter wet climate, then the low delta O18 season is the wet season. And in this case, the delta 18 of clay relative to carbonate will be lower. So our big delta value will be more negative. And 
the larger that wintertime bias is, the more negative our big delta value can be. On the other hand, if summer is our wet season, then the clay delta 18 will be higher than relative to carbonate. And our big delta will be positive because summer is the high delta 018 wet season. And the larger, the greater a summer bias that we have, the more positive our big delta value will be. So this is the interpretive framework that we're going to bring forward. Uh, and we'll test this out over space before we apply it through time. And I'll talk about what that means on this next slide. So I'm going to look at these data in these three domains I laid out earlier, the West, Central, and East. These define three uh, topographically distinct regions of the Western United States. And um, we can kind of test you know, how our big delta interpretive framework works by looking over space, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a pretty stark seasonality gradient in the Western US across the, uh, from East to West or West to East today with a more winter wet climate in the West and a more summer wet climate in the East. And what this means is that if this gradient existed in the past, uh, we expect a more negative big delta value in the West and the less negative big delta value in the East. We should be able to resolve trends in big delta over space to build confidence in our interpretive framework before we start applying it over time. So I'm gonna show you just the pre-open habitat transition data first. And I'll show you this with the average big delta value in the box and the 95% the confidence interval around the mean uh, as the error bars. So um, this is what I'm showing here. The Western in, in purple is the most negative big delta. And as we move to the East, uh, it's more positive. So we have this trend from more negative to more positive from West to East consistent with that winter wet to summer wet gradient that we mapped out earlier. What we care about now, the same gradient will hold after the open habitat transition when grasslands began to expand. But what we care about is the direction that this gradient moves. Is it become, going to become more uh, negative or big delta value is gonna shift negatively? This would be consistent with the summer aridity hypothesis uh, becoming less summer wet and moving to the left. Or will these values shift to the right, uh, reflecting a less winter wet climate um, and moving toward more positive big delta values. So what we find is very difficult to reconcile with the, the hypothesis that summer drying drove grassland expansion and in a less winter wet climate is consistent with this open habitat transition. And now that we have this, we can begin to, to uh, develop a hypothesis about what actually drove this transition. So what I'm showing you on the top is the same map from before. Uh, this is the modern precipitation seasonality. And this is what I, I'm going to call the grassland state. Uh, what I did is I took the, the big delta values over space here, related them to modern seasonality, and then extrapolated to what that means for seasonality based on the big delta values in the past. So this is a crude analysis, but it gives us an idea of the magnitude of change in seasonality associated with the expansion of these grassy habitats. And the first thing that emerges when we do this on the bottom right is that everything is more winter wet, unsurprisingly, uh, but the, the cascades don't appear to make a large influence on precipitation seasonality before the open habitat transition. They, are, uh, they really just don't appear on this map. And this is our first indication that tectonics can be a driving factor in the expansion of open habitat ecosystems. This is not a terribly surprising result. Uh, grasslands exist largely in the rain shadow of the cascades today. And dropping down the Cascades would allow more winter moisture to penetrate deep into the continental interior, even as far east as the Great Plains. We also know that this lines up with the data. Um, we see that the clay delta 18 and the phytolith delta 18 show basically a unidirectional shift. Once they change across the open habitat transition, they don't return back to their pre-open habitat transition values. And this is exactly what we expect if tectonics, such as the uplift of the Cascades, is driving this transition. The uplift of the Cascades is likely to cause drier winters uh, because the Cascades are really, really good at blocking winter moisture, but not very good at blocking summer moisture. So Cascades uplift will dry the landscape out overall, but preferentially remove moisture in the winter time, uh, leading to a less winter wet climate as we observe in the data. So uh, a couple of quick take homes from this part, clay and carbonate Delta 18 diverge as these grassy habitats expand across the Western US. And uh, based on the clay carbonate difference, the big delta value, this diverging trend is most consistent with a shift to drier winters, not a shift to drier summers. 
and it's best explained by the uplift of the Cascades that would preferentially dry out wintertime and lead to drier conditions overall. What this means for the resilience of these ecosystems is that the forests that span the western U.S. survived the changes in climate that span through the Eocene to the Oligocene, and it really took, based on this, this interpretation of the data, literally a tectonic change in the landscape uh, before we, we were able to drive major forest dieback. But these forests were resilient to climatic changes that occurred before this, uh, but not resilient to the uplift of mountain ranges that uh, severely blocked off moisture sources. So with that, we're going to transition over to uh, the Amazon case study. And I'm already running a little bit shorter on time than I was planning. So I'm going to go maybe a little bit faster through this or skip through a couple of parts. But what I want you to get from this is two things. First is that this is a case where we don't have quantitative constraints on precipitation. And that's the first thing that I want to do is provide some new constraints on the amount of change in the past. When I say the past, we're looking at really just the last 25,000 years or so, so a much smaller time scale. Um, and the second thing that we're going to talk about is what does what do these, these changes in climate mean for understanding the resilience of the rainforest and why it survived these changes in precipitation in the past. This is an image of the mouth of the Amazon River and out of the mouth of this river flows about 20% of all of the moisture that runs off of all of the continents on our planet every single year. This is an immense amount of water and it's largely supported by the South American monsoon. If we want to understand precipitation in tropical South America, we have to understand the South American monsoon. And right now we don't, uh, at least not how it has varied in the past. Um, there are uh, the main hypothesis that exists for South American monsoon dynamics has to do with changes in the strength of the monsoon. But it's not a secret, it's an open problem that these theories don't reconcile a lot of the proxy data very well. Um, this is a map of mean annual precipitation, and the monsoon is denoted by the intersection of these two yellow lines. You can think about the horizontal line as like the inner tropical convergence zone or uh, the tropical rain belt, and the vertical line is basically the vertical orientation of that. It's just the, the same component or the same metric, but in the, the vertical component. And uh, these two lines can move as a function of climate. Uh, I call this the energy flux equator, and the vertical one is the energy flux prime meridian. And as climate moves, the intersection of these lines, basically where the monsoon is the strongest, will move as well. And so in addition to changing its strength, the monsoon can also migrate over space, north, south, and east and west, depending on which line is moving. I'm going to test a hypothesis that the migration of the monsoon has driven changes in past rainfall. We've tested this with a few different modeling analyses. I don't have time to get into most of them, but I will get into one which just looks at the magnitude of change in precipitation. This is a useful metric in this case uh, because changes in monsoon strength are shown to only really change rainfall in the Amazon by a few hundred millimeters per year at most. But the fundamental migration of the monsoon causes much larger changes in rainfall because it's similar to if you're at one point and the monsoon migrates away from you, the magnitude of change in rainfall is similar to you migrating away yourself from the monsoon region. So the change in rainfall can be up to about a meter per year or a thousand millimeters per year, which is quite substantial. The other reason that it's important that we can distinguish between monsoon strength and monsoon migration is that there's a theorized forest grassland tipping point that it occurs at about 2000 millimeters per year. Uh, we don't really know how the Amazon rainforest responds to drying below this tipping point. So uh, monsoon migration would certainly plunge us below this tipping point, we need to test if it's realistic or, or uh, a, a reasonable hypothesis given the data that we have. And my screen is freezing up, so please bear with me. Um, we're gonna use oxygen isotopes again. These are three oxygen isotope records that were uh, here. We've done a bunch of work to show that these three sites are hydrologically connected. And what this means is that we can interpret the difference in their oxygen isotope ratios as indicative of how much moisture is being rained out from an air mass moving from one site to the next. What I mean by this is that the difference in delta 18 from site one to site two, for example, will be greater if there's more rain out, more precipitation relative to evapotranspiration, and it'll be smaller if there's less rain out. So a steeper gradient is wetter and a shallower gradient is drier. I'm just going to put up the three different gradients that emerge. We're going to look at today, 
the mid Holocene about 6,000 years ago and the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago and just do kind of a quick run comparison before we quantify precipitation changes from these gradients. So our hypothesis is that the monsoon centroid, which is again, this intersection of these two lines has migrated through time. And it exists where the steepest change in 018, the most rain out uh, exists on the landscape. Today, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, and we, we know that it's somewhere in the middle in the last 1000 years, the oxygen isotope data support this with a similar gradient on both sides. Here we have the three sites on the x-axis, moisture is moving from east to west. At the mid-Holocene, the isotope gradients are shallower, consistent with drier conditions, and there's abundant evidence for a drier landscape at this time as well. And at the last glacial maximum, uh, the steepest part of this transition occurs in uh, the, the inland, con the continental interior, uh, consistent with the monsoon shifting westward, with most of the rain out happening in the western Amazon. So uh, this is the hypothesis that we're going to test. And the way I'm going to test it just for today is by quantifying precipitation rates from these changes in Delta 018. We're going to focus on just this inland part for a couple of reasons. But one of them is that this is where we should see the largest signal, if the hypothesis is correct, from a wetter condition at the LGM, when the monsoon is smack dab in the middle of this domain, to a drier condition at the mid-Holocene when it's not. So. Uh, I developed a model to take these spatial isotopic signatures and reconstruct precipitation um, in the first part of my PhD. And what this is shown here during the last 1000 years is just precipitation estimated from the isotopes alone using that model. And modern rainfall is this orange box for, for comparison. I'm not gonna talk about the PMIP3 models here. I meant to remove that from the slide and uh, I, I, I forgot. Um, but looking at the mid Holocene, uh, conditions are much drier. This distribution looks a little bit wonky because there's really no change in Delta 018 in the mid Holocene, which means that we can't constrain the minimum rainfall at the mid Holocene, but we can constrain the upper bound. And the conditions were around 1500 millimeters per year of precipitation. You can get higher, but these involve very specific combinations of climatic parameters that are not very likely to have actually occurred. So the mid Holocene estimate is drier. And this is again, an upper bound on how, how wet it possibly could have been given the isotopic data. And at the last glacial maximum, uh, conditions are wetter with rainfall about more if we account for some other changes in climate that are consistent with, um, with independent proxy data. So what this means is that as we move from the last glacial maximum to the mid Holocene, there's a substantial change in rainfall, at least as indicated by the oxygen isotope data. Uh, when I say substantial, I mean close to a thousand millimeters per year or more. This is a magnitude of change consistent with monsoon migration, and it crosses that tipping point that I mentioned before. And in the last couple of minutes here, I wanna discuss whether or not this is even reasonable. <laughs> uh, crossing this tipping point and getting down to 1300 millimeters per year um, is a challenge when we're thinking about the survival of a rainforest. In fact, uh, it was one of the first reviewer comments on, on this work. And so we did an entire other project just to test if this is a reasonable result. And I'll share just some of the results of that project here. If, uh, again, if the slides will advance the way that I want them to. <laughs> okay, so what I'm showing you in this map is modern precipitation on the x-axis and modern tree cover on the y-axis. All, or I should say precipitation and tree cover, all these gray data points are modern data in tropical South America. This red line is just a smooth fit through these data. And the dashed line is the 2000 millimeter per year tipping point that I talked about before. Our proxy reconstruction uh, has precipitation right around this teal bar. And we know that tree cover remained high in the Amazon region uh, at the mid Holocene. So this puts the mid Holocene up and to the left, far away from where this red line is. And this begs the question, is it actually reasonable for the rainforest to survive when conditions are this dry? Um, when, so, we're gonna look here at, uh, what, the first thing we did is we used a dynamic global vegetation model forced with the mid Holocene precipitation estimates to compare to the proxy data and see, can we reproduce the proxy data at our mid Holocene estimate of precipitation using this model? And what we found is that with, this is the region that uh, we really care about because it's the region where we use the isotope data to reconstruct rainfall 
And when we do this, we, we find that the tropical rainforest in dark green uh, still remains intact. We do have some encroachment of savanna landscape on the periphery. And this is also what we see in the, the proxy data shown on the left. Uh, but in large part, the, the dynamic global vegetation model is consistent with the proxy data when it's forced with our estimate of mid-Holocene precipitation. So this is our first indication that it's not unreasonable to expect high tree cover at precipitation rates that are this low in the Amazon. So uh, one thing that we can ask is, OK, well, so here are the dynamic global vegetation model results for a handful of different simulations. And tree cover remains high, even as precipitation gets lower. We don't follow this red line, which is a less resilient line. Uh, we follow this, this gold line, which is a more resilient line. And when we think about why the rainforest could have survived, this is a challenging question to answer. Um, but one of the reasons that, that matters, uh, or that we think matters a lot based on observational and modeling evidence fire. So we're going to talk a little bit about the role of fire in the mid-Holocene. Um, observations and models alike tell us that in the tropics, if you have fire that is very, very responsive to precipitation, that is, fire increases a lot with a little bit of drying, it's within a certain range of precipitation, um, you will end up at either a savanna if your fire is very active, or a forest if your fire is not very active. This is that range that I'm showing in, in orange. Uh, where if you're drier than this range of precipitation, you tend to always be at a low tree cover state. And if you're higher than this range, you tend to just about always be at a high tree cover state. So the strength of the fire feedback on precipitation uh, is one thing that matters a lot when we're thinking about the survival of a rainforest once precipitation is within this region, which we found it to be in the mid-Holocene. So we disabled fire in the dynamic global vegetation model. The results were not all that surprising because tree cover was already high, but it gets a little bit higher. And that's what these purple squares are showing here. So vegetation is at least weakly sensitive to whether or not fire exists in the model. Um, but again, fire is not enough in the simulation to actually collapse the forest and cause a savanna state, which is what we would expect if we followed this red line. So we can also look at the proxy data. Um, this is the last 12,000 years. And this is a proxy for precipitation. It's the isotopic gradient, so the change in delta 18 over space, where higher values are drier and lower values are wetter. If fire is really sensitive to precipitation, we should see fire or a, a proxy for fire looking like this. Um, we find uh, this is a charcoal index put together by my colleague Yoshi Mizumi, and there's no real strong correlation between these two metrics. This doesn't mean that fire was weakly responsive to climate necessarily because humans were around at this time and they were burning stuff. It's very difficult to separate out the anthropogenic fire from the natural fire that is associated with climatological drying. Um, so we can't say for sure that this means that fire and precipitation were not closely linked to each other at this time or that the fire feedback was weak. But what we can say is at this point, we don't have strong evidence for a strong fire feedback in the mid-Holocene, indicating that a weak fire response could have been one thing that helped the rainforest stay alive as it got really dry. So uh, the weak fire response could have kept the rainforest intact. It works in the models. We don't have proxy evidence to tell us otherwise, but we still have this glaring inconsistency with the modern data. And this is the last thing I want to address in this talk. So I'm going to use these ball and cup diagrams that you might have seen before. The way that it works is that we basically drop a ball into this diagram and it'll, it'll uh, settle out in what we call a potential well that, re that relates to the stable state of the system. In this case, this is modern rainfall in the Amazon. So I'm using just this range of precipitation on the x-axis and the plot on the bottom right. And with this range of precipitation, looking at all of the tree cover data, we can construct a plot like this to find that the stable state of the system is the forest. This is for those that are interested, just it's pretty simple, it's just a, a probability density function flipped upside down. Uh, distributions of data like these. So we can do this for the mid-Holocene, right? We can say, given modern data at mid-Holocene levels of precipitation, what is the stable state of the system? And when we do this, the well at the forest gets shallower and shallower up until we tip the state of the system into a new savanna state, indicating that the landscape might not be as resilient uh, to, to drying as it was in the mid-Holocene when we know that tree cover was higher. However, um, these data have been used to argue that the, the Amazon is not very resilient to drying, but 
what I want to point out is that humans, the, the imprint, the signature of human activity is, is inseparable or difficult to separate at least from these data. Um, this is the data now colored by land use fraction with these brighter colors uh, are places where there's been more deforestation and more land use and darker colors are less land use. If we remove the highly deforested part of this, this plot, um, and only focus on the natural relationship between vegetation and climate where we have less deforestation, what we end up finding is that the, the forested state remains a stable state of the system. Even with these modern data, the modern Amazon appears as resilient to drying as it was in the mid Holocene, left to its own devices with that huge asterisk of left to its own devices without the interference of the intensive human land use that we're imparting on the landscape today. So our findings tell us that, that tree cover is pretty resilient to drying in the Amazon, at least more so than we might expect using other methods. And that this resilience is consistent with the modern observations of how tree cover and precipitation relate to one another. But ongoing human land use and deforestation can degrade this resilience. And it is more likely that this poses a more urgent threat to the Amazon rainforest than drying alone. So to bring it back to the beginning, how resilient is tree cover to drying? Uh, in part one, we found that open habitat expansion in the Western US uh, appeared to require the onset of a sharp rain shadow. Tree cover was resilient to climatic changes that occurred in the early part of the Cenozoic, but not to the uplift of a mountain range that blocked a lot of moisture. In part two, we found that rain, rainfall in the Amazon crossed a theoretical tipping point, but the forest survived drying beyond this point. So, these are two different case studies from two completely different points in time. They don't solve the question of how resilient is tree cover to drying, but they emphasize that at least in these two case studies, forests were appear to be pretty resilient to, to changes in global climate and to climatological drying, um, indicating that left to their own devices, they, they can be pretty resilient to these changes. Of course, there's a lot we don't understand about the establishment of semi-arid ecosystems and the expansion of grasslands uh, that really occurred in the past 20 million years or so. And studies like these that analyze the changes in vegetation and also the times of stasis as we did in the, in the Amazon can help inform the fundamental relationship between climate and terrestrial ecosystems and allow us to get a better grasp on their fundamental resilience to climate and therefore better separate out what effects humans are directly having on the landscape as opposed to anthropogenic climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a great presentation. It was really great um, to see your all of your data um, and all of the stories that your samples told you. Um, so just um, a quick reminder to everybody, uh, if you've got any questions, um, either drop them in the chat. Um, you can raise your hand um, or send them directly to our questions at PaleoPax host. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in already. Um, so the first question is, are there trends in total mean annual precipitation between winter wet and summer wet climates? For example, are winter wet climates drier overall or is there no pattern? This is a really good question. Um, I don't have an answer to this off the top of my head. Um, I think if you were to look globally that winter wet climates are likely drier overall because the tropics tend to be more summer wet and so do the subtropics and monsoon systems bring a lot more moisture than like the westerlies do um, in the Western US. Uh, but that largely has to do with the amount of moisture that can be held in those air masses because it's so much warmer. So if we account for that and scale it to that, I don't know if there's a relationship between winter wet versus summer wet climates. Um, kind of a sidebar that's, that's always fun to think about is that for a very long time, it was thought that the entire, like it, it, for a very long time, Western society uh, thought that only precipitation, the wet season could only ever be in the winter. Um, so back in like like the ancient Greeks uh, would think that the only, you can only get rainfall in the winter because it was colder and they observed that that's when you get dew on the landscape. Um, so they figured that everywhere in the world, winter had to be the wet season uh, because colder conditions led to the condensation of moisture. And they were shocked to find that the tropics were very different. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't have a good answer to that uh, in terms of globally speaking, but not a lot of the mid-latitudes are strictly winter wet. I think that Mediterranean or winter wet climates cover 
less than 10% of the land area on our planet. Um, I don't know if any of these numbers are helpful, but <laughs> uh, I don't have a, a, a good direct answer off the top of my head. Cool. Um, so there's a question that's been dropped in the chat. Um, so how did you correct the temperature effect on delta 18 of calcite versus delta 18 of clay? So uh, I see that this is asked by, by Yope, who I know has a lot of experience with clumped isotope thermometry, which is a technique for uh, under, or for resolving the formation temperatures of carbonate minerals. Um, and uh, one of the really kind of nice things about comparing clay and carbonate is, and I'll say this in two ways, uh, for those of you that are, are fans of isotopes, um, the temperature dependent fractionation slopes for these different minerals are really similar. And so what that means is that the difference between them is not very sensitive to temperature. Um, put another way, uh, the offset between the water delta O18 and the mineral delta O18 is really, really similar um, for clays and carbonates, uh, regardless of the temperature that they're forming. So there's a constant offset that we can really rely on. And that offset is about three and a half per mil. And what this means is that the difference in that big delta value is really insensitive to temperature. It will be sensitive to changes in like seasonal temperature, like if one mineral is forming in one season, that's warmer versus another mineral forming at a colder season. Um, this is useful to account for. And we did sensitivity analyses in the Western US to find that uh, the seasonal effect of temperature is about a third as large of an effect on the isotopes as the seasonal effect of precipitation itself. So precipitation changes are a, a thought to be a much larger signal on the system than changes in, in seasonal temperature. Nice. Um, there's another question. Um, so thanks, Tyler. Really interesting talk. It does seem that the tipping point concept is central, particularly in the, the Amazon example. Does your modeling take into account the stalite stabilizing slash precipitating effect that tree cover has? Is the idea that there's a runway effect? And what do you think this looks like in practice? A kind of reverse ecological succession and on what time scale? Yeah, this is um, uh, one of the leading challenges, I think, in trying to understand terrestrial ecosystem resilience in the tropics is, are these tipping points mechanistically really robust and are they going to emerge at a, at a definable point where we can identify a limit in the system? Um, the modeling that we did, the dynamic global vegetation model, is run at uh, basically a steady state. Uh, it, I, it produces like slight amounts of bi-stability, but it doesn't have the full bi-stability envelope that other models will produce. So investigating this further with other models is, is uh, certainly helpful. But whether we initialize this model from like a barren landscape or a vegetated landscape, we're able to resolve the same final point, uh, which is that you still have a forested ecosystem at mid-Holocene levels of rainfall. Um, so tree cover doesn't appear to be necessary to arrive at that result for the model that we used. I do think it probably is necessary to arrive at that result for other models. Actually, I know that it's necessary to arrive at that result for other models. Tree cover can be really stabilizing. I think this might be what Oliver is referring to as well, that tree cover can be a really stabilizing feature for precipitation in the Amazon, because as you move further and further west, a larger and larger fraction of all of your rainfall comes from transpiration uh, uh, in the landscape. I think about 50% of the rainfall in the western Amazon is recycled at least once through the basin already, and about 30% on the basin average. So tree cover plays a huge role in recycling that moisture. Um, and accounting for that role is really important. What we found in this study is that if you start from a forested landscape, you're going to tend to stay in a forested landscape even as precipitation rates get as low as, as the mid-Holocene rates. Um, this also occurs even though uh, some of the rainforest, some of the tree cover is replaced by semi-deciduous trees that are dropping their, their leaf litter and creating uh, more burnable biomass material that can dry up and, and allow for ignition. Uh, this increase in fire wasn't enough to actually cause major forest dieback in the model. So um, that relationship between precipitation and tree cover, uh, I don't know how strong it would be in other models, but at least in ours, it wasn't enough to, to cause that kind of transition. The kind of timescales that we'd be thinking about for like a tipping point and crossing these thresholds should be quicker than the timescales that I looked at, which was spanning over thousands of years. Um, but this is also debated. And 
it would probably be time scales of a few tree regenerations, like a, a few uh, tree generations, but I don't actually know for sure what time scales would be really important for crossing these critical tipping thresholds. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, really interesting work. To use the gradient in delta you know, as a proxy for rain out, do you have to assume the mass of rain out is small compared to the total mass of potential precipitation in the atmosphere to avoid rally effects? If so, is this a reasonable assumption for the Amazon? Um, yeah, so thanks Mason for that question. Um, I, I'd be interested to talk more about uh, understanding specifically what you mean by Rayleigh effects, because I think in a sense that this is actually what we're tracking. Um, the, the mass of rain out is, can be substantial, but what we're tracking is the, the difference in rain out versus evapotranspiration. So the classic Rayleigh distillation framework, which is it relates the delta 18 the isotopic composition of rainfall to how much moisture has been lost from an air mass. That classic rain framework uses the same kind of equations as like distillation of, of a chemical species. Um, and it tells us that as you have more and more rain out, your delta 18 of that rain out will get lower and lower and lower. Uh, what evapotranspiration can do is it basically offsets where you are along that Rayleigh trajectory. So um, what our model is doing is that there's no Rayleigh built into it in any sense. It's a reactive transport model that simulates an air mass, its transport over space, its rain out and its evapotranspiration and tracks the isotopes of all of these processes. And so it, it's basically simulating mechanistically how the air mass moves and how it exchanges moisture with the land surface. So the rain out can be substantial relative to the amount of moisture in the air mass. Um, and what we're ultimately tracking is the net balance of what goes out and what comes in and the isotopic compositions of those, uh, of the, of those bodies of moisture. I hope that helps um, answer the question. Avoiding Rayleigh effects, uh, I, I don't think that would be a reasonable assumption for the Amazon. Nice. Um, so we'll, we have one question, another one um, as a follow-up. Um, so what's your slash this research area's next big challenge? Um, thanks, Oliver. Uh, the next um, big challenge is <laughs> what I really would like to do is, is work on trying to separate out the anthropogenic or human fire from uh, the natural like fire climatic relationship. We only can say what we can say about fire and its relation die back in the tropics from the modeling work that we did. And I would, I, I feel kind of not very satisfied with the lack of empirical evidence that we have to support this relationship or uh, an assumed re weak relationship between precipitation and fire within that tree cover, or the precipitation range. So looking back further in time when humans weren't burning uh, stuff on the landscape would be a, a great step forward. And we're looking into ways to do that. Um, there aren't a lot of isotope data further back in time though. So this makes it challenging. But yeah, separating out the effect of anthropogenic fire would be very helpful. The other thing that we're doing in the Western US is uh, working on modeling the uplift of the Cascades to test the magnitude of change in that big delta value that I talked about before. The comparison of clay and carbonate minerals is, has been done before as long ago as 25 years ago, but it hasn't really been used to fully resolve seasonal trends like I've shown here. And so we're still developing this method as a tool for that. And we wanna do some modern calibration studies uh, to see how quantitative we can be with our estimates and also do that more modeling work that I, I talked about to, to link the magnitude of change in the data to a magnitude of change in terms of a climatological signal that is fully resolvable. So that'll take a while. <laughs> nice. It's, future projects are always the exciting part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so that's the end of the Q&A. Um, uh, so thank you very much again for your talk. Um, it was really cool to learn about this and learn about something that goes on on land since I'm an ocean scientist. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm now going to take over from you um, and do a quick close out. Um, okay, um, so thank you everybody for joining us. Um, please remember to fill out the weekly feedback form. The link will be in the chat really shortly um, so that we can learn a little bit more about who attended today's seminar. And join us next week um, at the same time to hear Abraham de Bengwa from the University of Woodwatersrand in South Africa talking about examining resilient and long-term rangeland health using multiple proxy paleoecological methods, an example from a South African grassland. <laughs>
So up next, um, we have tea time, which we'd very much encourage you to stick around for. Um, so um, it's a, a small amount of time, about half an hour, um, to talk with Tyler um, about um, research, his research um, and career path. Um, but now it's time for a very quick break um, for two minutes. So remember to get up, walk around, have a drink of water, um, come back in two minutes. And if you've got your paleo pets, uh, we love to see them. So please remember to bring them. Um, we'll catch you shortly.